to one and all present sir here i welcome you all for the ninth session of online faculty development program on e vehicles challenges and opportunities in future india sponsored by aict training and learning academy conducted by department of mechanical engineering rmk college of engineering technology it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker mr s balaji from renault nissan technology and business center india private limited chennai he has a experience of more than 8 years in automobile electrical and electronics domain his experience extends to other domains like quality control and cost estimation vehicle testing havac and bms logic generation for embedded control units and graphics designer he has received quality award and chinese star award for the performance in renault nissan technology with this short introduction i will hand over the session to our speaker mr balaji sir please sir thank you very much mr ashok kumar so good afternoon to one and all present here so today i'm going to present uh, Uh, rather than i i would say like i would like to share you some of the technologies which are available in the automobile which which are going to be the future so before beginning my presentation i would like to share some general trivia uh, please mute your microphone for better experience unfortunately due to severe thunderstorm lot uh, last night uh, here the wifi is not available so i am in 4g connection so there may be some delay in audio however i have taken care uh, to maximum extent that there should not be any delay but kindly i request you all to switch off your video for better reception and uh, please do not hesitate to stop me if you have any questions in between uh, also i may ask you some questions in between i request any one of you to unmute yourself to answer them and uh, uh, i have full charge in my laptop good enough to complete this presentation and uh, most welcome are the feedbacks at the end of the presentation so let's begin so before getting into the technologies i would like to give you uh, a gist of what is happening in the field of uh, electric vehicles recently so everywhere you uh, it it has become a buzzword now that the electric vehicles are going to be the future so if you see uh, in 2018 the ic engine the conventional ic engine is around 69 million of sales which has dropped to 64 million in 2019 but at the same time in 2019 the electric car sales has increased to 2.1 million from 1.9 the previous year the ev share as you see is uh, generally uh, um, step by step it's increasing from 3% uh, and it is estimated to be around 7% in 2023 in uh, around 10% in 2025 and uh, in 2030 it's hoping 28% so as you see as you can see the graph here by the future is clearly uh, electric vehicles so you can uh, you can see the green which is a internal combustion engine which uh, which will uh, face a drop in sales gradually there will be an increase in the electric vehicles so why evs we can or we can answer this questions from three point of view first is the from the government point of view government can reduce the oil inputs and they they can also reduce the pollution uh, and uh, the worst fact is that out of 30 polluted cities 21 are in india these two will give benefits to a government as well as to the people from the customer point of view ic engine has a very less efficiency when compared to the electric motor electric motor has more efficiency so overall 76% increase in efficiency you can feel when you use a electric car and a low total cost of ownership and quick and fun driving so a uh, quick driving in the sense like electric cars will quickly reach the speed when compared to ic engine from the manufacturer point of view they are easy to meet the cap c target a uh, cap c is nothing but it's a regulation where uh, the our government has set up a guideline that any manufacturer should emit only this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so for example if they are emitting more than 1 gram per kilometer they need to pay a 15 million penalty okay so if they use a electric car this can be zero and they can easily meet the target and they can also put themselves into a new business where they can uh, uh, sell, sell chargers quick charging stations etc etc so the benefits coming uh, to the uh, coming when when we switch to the ev so uh, we uh, that, this is the major reason why every manufacturer is switching towards ev now now i am coming into the technology how it was before if you see the automobiles how it was it was more like mechanical there were no electronic components the steering was very hard like you need to turn it very hard in order to uh, turn the car hard brakes you need to push it very hard and the tough and rigid structure which made us the which has put the safety at risk and they are less reliable system 
as per the famous saying that necessity is the mother of invention we slightly moved towards safety uh, and uh, now the safety pace is increasing very much now when we shift towards the safety between 1980s and 90s we have got a more reliable systems which are even highly accurate and it has reduced accidents to a larger extent in today's car if you see there are more than 1000 electronic components which is helping us in one or the other way now what kind of electronics are there in automobile initially there it was completely mechanical so we had a switch to electronics in order to improvise safety and accuracy so what type of electronics there are few uh, i have mentioned a few types of electronics where we have engine engine room electronics transmission electronics related to gearbox and we have chassis electronics passive safety related electronics driver assistance passenger comfort and infotainment systems among these topics today we'll be focusing more on chassis safety driver assistance and passenger comfort which will be common for both ic engine as well as an ele electric vehicles which will be coming in the future coming to the chassis electronics we have again uh, subdivisions of four uh, several systems which are available in chassis electronics anti lock braking system traction control system electronic brake force distribution and electronic stability program so these are some of the components which are available in the chassis electronics we will go one by one so until uh, this point i would like to have a little pause here uh, just to uh, uh, just to get a feedback from you is my flow is okay yes sir thank you very much bibin yeah so coming to abs abs is nothing but anti lock braking system uh, there is a slight misconception here that uh, people uh, when abs is there braking efficiency is like that that is normally a misunderstanding here the abs is one component in the car or even today it is available in bike which will prevent our wheel from locking normally when you have when you when you are applying a sudden brake in your car you won't be able to steer your car because the friction will be very high between your tire and the road which will lock the wheel into the road and it will never allow you to steer because of it what it will happen you can see in this image without abs if you apply the brake at this point the dash line the car will go brake here but it will if there is any obstacle going to be there here the car will never stop you you cannot steer and it will go and dash further but if there is a car with abs you apply a brake here you see there is an obstacle here the car will allow you to steer a little bit so that you can avoid an obstacle here so this is one of the very good safety which has been regulated in india uh, considering the level of safety it offers our government of india has regulated thanks to them uh, and today if you go buy a car you cannot buy a car without abs all vehicles are mandatorily equipped with abs which reduce accidents drastically so what are the components available we have a controller obviously to control the uh, braking mechanisms we have a speed sensors will be having valves and pumps so uh, i will uh, just explain the block diagram i will just show the image here i'll explain it in the next slide once we apply the brake we have an information from wheel speed sensor which will be processed into the controller and the controller will modulate the valves in order to adjust the brake so how it is working normally all four wheels have the individual wheel speed sensors the ecu which i said the control unit which will read the signal from each sensors so after the speed sensors detect that the speed of any wheel is reducing drastically normally when the speed when when we are trying to steer like speed there will be a several alterations at this point of time what the ecu will do ecu will send a signal to close the valve and the brake pressure is released so when the brake pressure is released you will be able to steer your car once you have steered successfully and the wheels will start accelerate again the signal is again sent to the ecu in order to apply the brake so that you stop your vehicle by this way by opening and closing of valves in a, a periodically the your vehicle will also be in control at the same time you can also steer your car by the way your entire car will be under your control this also reduce the amount of braking distance little bit so the cycle repeats itself until the application of brakes becomes normal so this is how the abs works coming to the next type of chassis electronics which is vdc so how many of you have here have experienced driving in a rainy road or the road which is totally wet any one of you please unmute yourself let's have an interactive session hello participants you can have your uh, communication you are allowed to unmute 
any one of you have ever uh, had a driving experience in a wet road wet surface no one even a two wheeler is fine yes, yes. yeah yes, so what will happen when when you apply a sudden brake in a slippery road actually when you are accelerating we feel that as if the car is uh, floating on a surface like that we feel the, we don't feel any friction exactly and exactly. Uh, when we suddenly apply the brake uh, we feel that it is uh, uh, skidding and going out of control level. exactly thank you for that answer you have exactly come to the point that is where we have this system so in a normal steering in a normal condition on a slippery road the car will tend to oversteer the technical term which we use is oversteer even though you might not give your steering input but the car itself will steer itself due to the loss of friction okay so that due to this loss of traction between the tire and road the car it, it might lead us to a fatal accident this system will try to reduce that accident by controlling the traction okay so what components does it have normally it will have a yaw rate sensor yaw rate is nothing but where the car is exactly pointing assume like this red color icon is the car the, this direction will be given by yaw rate suppose if it is inclined like this or inclined like this the angle will differ also we'll be having a steering angle sensor this will help us to understand what angle the user is turning the steering wheel next is the accelerometer which is similar to one which we have in our mobile phones wheel speed sensor the same which we saw in abs and the control module okay so the working principle is very simple the speed sensors will provide continuous data continuously it will be monitoring the speed normally when there is a loss of traction uh, the steering angle will be straight, but the yaw rate, uh, which will differ by the system will compute the, uh, the difference between this yaw rate and the steering. Suppose if there is going to be a difference, which means that the vehicle is slipping, what the, what the system will do, the system will automatically apply brakes wherever it is needed. Thereby it will control, uh, the acceleration and thereby it will control the traction and it will hold your car firmly on the road. So this is how the system works. Thereby, you will you can avoid a slippage. Okay, coming to the next component, uh, electronic brake force distribution. So this is uh, this is normally uh, coming in tandem with the ABS unit. ABS will be equipped along with the EBD. The main purpose of EBD is that we it will uh, EBD first of all stands for electronic brake fo brake force distribution. So the brake will be distributed across the four wheels. So uh, normally we don't require uh, all a, a similar force of braking in all the wheels. For example, consider you are traveling on a sea surface or a seashore or something like that. So what what can, what might happen is that some portion of uh, maybe the left side of the car will be on a muddy surface, right side will be on a normal surface. Such combinations can happen whenever you are driving. Even you can consider this case where uh, you are applying, uh, you are driving on a slippery road. Your left side will be slippery and the right side will be normal. So now this kind of different uh, friction surfaces will lead us to a differential braking, which can cause an accident. So what this electronic brake force system will do, it has the similar components uh, like speed sensor, EC on brake force modulator, similar to one which we saw in the ABS recently. So when uh, when we apply the brake, the the weight will shift across the across its four wheels. Suppose if the momentum of the vehicle, normally when we brake, the momentum of the vehicle will keeps it moving at a speed, which is faster than the speed at which the wheels are rotating. This is due to the loss of traction. This results in a loss of traction between the tires and the road. This again will cause, uh, our, cause ourselves to lose control, thereby resulting in an accident. What EBD system will do, it will just reduce the brake wherever it is needed. Maybe for example, in right side, if you have a good amount of surface, there, there it will reduce the brake pressure. In left side, it will increase the brake pressure, thereby balancing between the left side and right side of your cars and putting it back to the traction on the actual road. Thus, it will avoid a turning or uh, some uh, slippage on when you are driving. This is one system. And finally, the continuation and the last part of the chassis electronics will be the hill start assist. Uh, anyone experienced uh, in driving hill stations? OT Kodakonal, maybe Tirupati also. Anyone? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, have you explore what what experience you will have? We, okay, assume that uh, you are stuck in a traffic in a hill station, uh, and uh, the traffic is moving very slowly. 
the moment you start the car, what you feel? In a hill station, assume that you are in a slopey surface. Vehicle will move backward directly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the what will happen is that whenever we are driving on a hill surface, thank you for the answer by the way. So uh, the vehicle will start rolling backwards. This might, even though the accident will not be fatal, but it will damage the other person's car, which is close enough to our vehicle. What this hill start assist system will do is it will help us prevent the rollback when we are starting up again a stopped position on an incline. So it will assist from keeping a car from rolling backward and it will allow only uh, us to move forward in the direction. So what, how it is work, how it, what basically it does. Basically, hill start assist system will hold the brake for you when you switch your foot. Normally we'll be applying the brakes when we are standing and when we want to move, there will be a small time, maybe some two seconds or three seconds where we shift our leg from the brake to the accelerator pedal. So that point of time is where your car will move backwards. But when the car is equipped with this system, the system itself will understand that you are in an incline surface and you are about to accelerate for a short amount of time. It will hold your brakes so that your vehicle will never go backwards. So how it does basically, we'll be having a sensor to detect the whether uh, the vehicle is in incline. Maybe an accelerometer will do this purpose. So this will understand whether the car is an incline or a flat position. Normally it will not work in flat position. It will work only in the incline position. So it will maintain the brake pressure as I said for a set period of time whenever we switch. Even we can equip the system in a manual transmission where the system will hold the brake pressure until you a driver lets up on the clutch. Okay, so, so it, it can work in both manual transmission as well as automotive transmissions. So we saw we have completed the, we have come to an end for the chassis electronics. So before moving to airbag, I pause here for any queries or uh, any suggestions in my pace of presentation. It was very clear, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for the answer, uh, Ribbon. So uh, let me move to the next system, passive safety. Uh, just uh, to be inquisitive on this, anyone can uh, just guess what, why it is called as a passive safety. There is one more thing, active safety, which I will explain. But I have specifically put airbag as a passive safety. Can anybody just give me a guess while this? Um does not use any energy energy okay any other answers it uh, works after the accident exactly yes for the first answer actually it uses some kind of energy this is again based on the newton's law of motion yes the term why it is called as passive because this system will not help you in avoiding an accident but this system will help you when an accident has taken place. So uh, when will airbags deploy normally? When the car is met with an accident and then only it will deploy. So that means the car is damaged. But you, you, uh, it wants the drivers and the passengers to be safe. That is the reason it's called passive. On the opposite side, an active safety system like ABS will avoid an accident. So that means both car and ourselves are safe. So they are called as active safety systems. So coming to passive safety airbag, again, Airbag uh, is regulated in India, thanks to the government of India. So today, if you go buy a car, definitely you will be having an airbag, at least for the driver. So they are nothing but a gas inflated cushions to save the passengers from the cars. And it is a supplementary system where it will work only in tandem if you wear seatbelt. And the physics behind this airbag is the Newton's second law of motion. So uh, what normally it states, when objects are not restrained, they continue to move at the speed of moving car in case of a crash. So you are sitting in the driver position and if there is no airbag and when the car stops suddenly, you will go move forward and you will hit yourself in either steering or the dashboard. So what airbags will do, it will slow down the passenger speed gradually to zero. That is how it works. So the components which are available in the airbag system is airbag itself, which is a basically a nylon fabric, a crash sensor and an electronic control unit. So what this crash sensor will sense, whether the crash is happened or not, there will be an inflator, which is basically an electric igniter, you can say, which will ignite uh, the chemicals, thereby producing a sudden of, uh, uh, nitrogen gas, which deflates very soon. I will explain it very clearly in the next slide. So what will, uh, any doubts, sorry. Okay, fine. So 
Uh, yes, as I said, there will be a crash sensor here. Once the crash is detected, we have a contact established here. And once the contact established, we have a chemical sodium acide, which gets uh, splitted into sodium and nitrogen. This nitrogen will, uh, the, uh, the release of this nitrogen is very instantaneous and it will uh, almost fill the entire airbag in a fraction of a second. Okay, so once this nitrogen is filled, this sodium cannot be left alone. So this is mixed with potassium nitrate in order to form some uh, subcomponents in order to avoid a hazardous chemical uh, exposure. And this nitrogen, which is used to fill the black, will expand very quickly when the inflation takes place. So this is how an airbag system works. And there are several types of airbags. Of course, everything has the same working mechanism. We have a side airbags. We have a curtain airbags. And also, in a, uh, there are uh, there are some cars which are under testing where the adaptive airbag is used, which means whenever only airbags will deploy only when the passenger is available, because this will save a lot of money. Assume like you are driving and uh, without a passenger, in worst case, an yeah, accident happens, and if both the airbags are deployed, you need to replace both the modules, which is an unnecessary cost for customers or uh, insurers, whatever it is. So whenever we have an adaptive airbag system, only place where the passenger is, that particular airbag will be uh, open, opened up deployed i can see so this is the overall working of a airbag system moving to the next interesting system is the hill descent hello uh, anyone has a question i can hear somebody has unmuted uh, uh, thank you i kindly request you all to please mute your mic uh, for better experience thank you okay so uh, uh, moving to the next system, hill descent control. This is just an opposite of what we saw in the hill start assist. So hill descent control, normally uh, the, the new drivers are tend to uh, lose control whenever they, are, uh, whenever they are descending down the hill. Thereby, it, uh, they, they can meet with accidents. So this system will help you to have a steady speed whenever you are driving down a hill or other decline. Steady the car speed whenever we are driving down the hill and it will manage our car speed going up a hill in some cases as well. So what it will do? It will the way, it will just keep the vehicles at a predetermined safe speed whenever we are traveling down the hill. This will allow us to focus more on scanning the downhill path for potential hazards. When we need this is basically a system which we need to activate. This will not be activated automatically just like an airbag. There will be a switch because some experienced persons will hate it because the system will reduce the speed and they cannot enjoy their driving basically. So we, there will be a switch provided where you can switch it off if you don't want the system. And uh, this system will uh, the system will just ad the, adjust the set speed maybe to 5 km or 7 km depending on the manufacturer. And even though if you press accelerator beyond your certain limit, the system will not increase the speed. Thereby, you can safely descend your car until you reach a safe spot. So this is how the hill descent system works. Moving on to the next system, the emergency brake assist. So this is one of the very interesting system uh where like uh, uh some uh, we would have experienced in few cases uh breaking in parking situation maybe like a dog coming in front of uh, some uh, scooters or a cyclist passing away so in those cases what people normally tend to do a study result has declared that when people are making an emergency half of the drivers do not break press the brake fast enough or hard enough to make the full use of braking power Normally, what they will do, they will just they will do a breaking in a panic, which will make them uh, go out of their mind, and they will not press the brake pedal fully. So this system will recognize the signs of emergency braking, and it will provide an assistance to the braking by itself with an extra brake support. Thereby, your whole braking is achieved. Normally, this will work in combination with the ABS braking as effective as possible while avoiding the wheel lockage. There in a, a cyclist is losing a, losing her for shortly in front of the brake. A lot like a cat just most uh, so there's a lag in noise uh, passing our way to make an emergency stop. You know? Hello, Bibin? Uh, lagging, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, now it's better or still it is lagging? Now it's better, better. Yeah, thank okay. you. Now voice is clear, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yes. So some animals can f fall in front of our car. Uh, 
forcing us to make an emergency stop or maybe this can also happen when we are uh, going in a hill where we need to hard break in some cases so well, how the system is work how the system will work it uses an ecu basically a control unit that compares the instances of breaking to the threshold levels if a driver pushes the brake down hard enough and fast enough to surpass the threshold there will be a level normal braking and the emergency braking suppose if this threshold is exceeded the, the control unit will determine that there is an emergency and it will boost there will be a brake booster available it will boost the brake speed in order to stop the vehicle immediately so many of the systems are kind of normally adaptable what means it will compile the information as you drive it will learn it's it's like a kind of machine learning where the system will learn how you are braking in a normal situation and in case of an emergency it will save its own data and with the saved data it will work uh, how to apply a brake whenever there is an emergency so this is how this system works now moving to the next type of adas uh, lane warning system so i would take a pause here and uh, i would like to uh, get some uh, questions from you if you have any doubts please Okay. I assume everything is okay. Well, this is Mohan here. Uh, the one uh, I, was, uh, I was a presenter uh, today morning. I have a simple doubt in hill assist systems. Uh, okay. Is there any uh, provision for manual over uh, override? Suppose if there is an emergency accident situation or road situation where you will have to go back immediately to avoid a uh, you know very strange, very uh, dangerous situation, you will not be able to go back. No? Uh, in the, you are talking about the descent control or the start assist. Okay, normally, as I said, or it works switch. once in whenever you or don't in want. Level, can I dis disable that? You can disable. Yes, you can disable this feature if you don't want. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So normally this will be having a switch available in the dashboard, as I said, when you when you want to this uh, actually uh, this will be appreciated only by the newbies, whoever like uh, driving new and uh, cannot maintain a control in a descent surface that way uh, hill descent control works. So normally like experienced driver can easily switch it off. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so fine. I'll move with my next topic, Adas. Of course, if you have any doubts in between, you can uh, please stop me uh, there itself. Okay, so coming to the Adas system. Adas normally means Advanced Driver Assist Systems. Adas is an entry point of uh, automation. The, the, there is a buzzword happening in the market of fully self-driving, self-driving cars, autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles. The starting point of all these systems is Adas. That is the reason it is named as advanced driver assistance systems. It is assisting the driver so that it is it is uh, getting a portion of the driver's work. It is doing by itself. Thereby, we are stepping towards uh, automation in the car. Okay. So, to begin with, it's a lane warning. Normally, most of the accidents in highways happen because we are departing our own lane. There are there are normally a medium speed lane, high speed lane, and a low speed lane. By mistake, if you are entering a medium speed lane into a high speed lane, the vehicle with the high speed will hit you, thereby causing an accident. So, you know, the, to avoid this, we need to keep ourselves in the lane, preferably in the center of a lane, just like how the cars. So, this system will help you in achieve achieve that in three different ways. I'll explain you the ways one by one. First is the lane departure warning. It is just a warning where there will be a camera. All these systems will be having a camera in order to monitor the lanes, normally the striped lanes, which is available. So whenever our car is crossing a lane or it is about to cross a lane without a turn indicator, all these learn lane warning systems will be activated only if you cross the lane without a turn indicator. If you have a turn indicator, it means that you are voluntarily going to cross something, so the system will not be activated. Without having a turn signals, if you are crossing a lane, the system will give you a warning, like in the in maybe in the instrument cluster or in the audio unit, or through via speakers that you are you are depart you are departing the lane. So please center yourself. It is the responsibility of a driver to say to acknowledge this warning and center his car. This is the first type and a basic type in the lane departure one. 
The next type of warning is the lane keep assist. This is one step ahead of the system which I told you earlier. The system will itself try to recenter the car to in this in the lane. So whenever you are just about to dip, uh, deviate a lane, the system will my, uh, do a mild steering by itself, and it will it will just pull you into this uh, lane. And this has a different names like we call it as a lane assist, side assist in Audi, lane departure alert in Toyota, or lane departure prevention. Different names by different names. The final one, which is most preferable, is the lane centering assist. As I said earlier, ideal thing is you should be in the center of your lane when you are driving. This is the best and the newest system, and it's completely a proactive system. What it will do with the help of cameras and the sensors which are mounted, so it will just calculate uh, the your car distance, whether it is centered among the lane, and the system itself will try to center you uh, so that you, uh, by even by mistake, you cannot cross the lane. How it works? Basically, all will be having a high mounted camera in the windshield. It captures the moving view of the road ahead as much as around 150 uh, feet. And the digitized image is passed for straighted and dashed lines, which is nothing but the lane markings. So as a driver, we are supposed to center the car between the two lanes. Still, it is not a fully autonomous system. It's just a partial autonomy. So when the car deviates and approaches the lane marking, the driver will get a warning. As well as, as I said, in some of the early, uh, some of the little advanced system, the car itself will move uh, towards by the, uh, of course, there will be a warning to you that car is centering itself. And in finally, in the lane keep assist, the car reaches the lane warning, the car will nudge itself away from the marker, as I said. So this is how the overall system of lane warning works. Okay, moving to the next ADAS feature, which is blind spot warning. Have you ever noticed blind spots in your two-wheeler also, in your two-wheeler or car? What is a blind spot, basically? Anyone, please? Anyone? You can just let me know what a blind spot is. OK. I'll explain to you what a blind spot is. So blind spot is nothing but a spot in a car which cannot be viewed by the driver even in the rear, even in the in, um, IRVM, which is the mirror internal, or the ORVM, which is the mirror outside the car. There, for all the vehicles, there are some regions where you cannot view. Say, for example, this is one of the typical blind spot location. You have your rear view mirror here. This will have some kind of angle. If the, the approaching vehicle is ahead of this angle, you cannot view that. But there is a chance that if you are crossing, if you are if you are moving from one lane to another lane, and if you did not notice this vehicle in, in, in our mirror, this vehicle can come and hit us. This is one of the very critical and safety feature which is offered in today's modern day vehicles. Of course, now uh, this feature is offered in all uh, uh, cars, uh, all uh, even some conventional uh, vehicles as well. Kia Seltos has this feature. Now let me explain you how this feature works basically. So um, this feature will warn a car or sometimes the other objects which is in your light, right or left blind spot. So warnings will normally appear in multiple positions, typically in the side view mirror. In the mirror itself, there will be one LED where it which will uh, which will blink or somehow it will give you a warning or it can be an audible warning as well that there is a vehicle in the blind spot so this feature uses sensors that always monitor the road on your sides these sensors are optimized to work at highway speeds because in highway will be moving at 80 or 90 kmph and that at that speed you need to sense the vehicle the crossing vehicle very quickly so advanced features will work with your turn signal. Normally, when we switch on, when we put on the turn signals, which means we are going to cross, the system will immediately warn you whenever there is a vehicle in your blind spot so that you can take an informed decision whether you can uh, overtake or you can cross the lane or not. Uh, it, can, it will use a normally uh, ultrasonic or radar kind of sensors. The sensors will be fitted in the rear bumper on both the sides. So we... Uh, <clears throat> However, there are some instances where the sensor will, will also be placed in a different location, maybe in the rear quarter panel or in the bumper cover as well. In few places, ultrasonic sensors will also be used, which will double itself as a blind spot warning. But the working principle is going to be the same. Either it's a radar or it's ultrasonic parking. Uh, it will go. It is going to send us an electromagnetic wave. The time of reflection, normally when there is no vehicle, 
the it will take uh, the reflection will not be immediate so but if there is a vehicle the the light rays will be uh, the uh, the electromagnetic waves will be reflected back to the sensor thereby it will indicate us that uh, there is a vehicle or some kind of obstacle in the blind spot which we need to take care this is how the system works of blind spot one coming to the a very interesting and uh, very useful feature of course uh, the park assist system in the adas um at least uh, the at least once or uh, even many times the car owners would have experienced uh, facing uh, difficulties in parking especially in a uh, in a kind of like parallel parking system we'll be having a very crunched space especially in uh, metro cities like chennai or mumbai so we'll be having a crunched space and we uh, there are some yeah, even sometimes we uh, by uh, mistakenly will park our car in a wrong position so that it will be uh, very difficult for us to take it back so such uh such problems always exist when we do a parking so the unsuccessful parking attempts are always frustrating and nerve racking park assist what it will do it will it, it will assist the driver into a suitable parking space within seconds without stress or hassle you all, all you all all you need to do is just a push of the button the assistant will park the vehicle by itself so how it is achieved it is achieved with the help of the ultrasonic sensor which we saw just in the previous slide for the blind spot warning what are the benefits so what it will do it will automatically measure the parking space whether that space will hold good for such for the kind of vehicle which we have effective utilization of tight parking spaces which may not be possible if uh, as a driver comfortable parking in and parking out no more annoying repairs which is caused by the bumps and scrapes when we do a wrong parking intelligent system for parking space measurement and calculation of optimal steering maneuvers the system it itself will calculate the amount how much it needs to steer in order to go into this parking it also supports us when we are parking in as well as we are parking out okay so what uh, how how this works the special sensor kind of an ultrasonic sensor is mounted on the side of the front bumper it scans the side basically the park assist will let the driver know immediately when it finds a suitable parallel or a perpendicular space so one, normally this will not be activated by itself driver should activate in order to enable this feature if the driver presses the button to activate the park assist the system will calculate the optimum path necessary steering moments and the number of maneuvers needed then once the calculation is done that's it your vehicle is under the control the driver you can just take off the, your hands from the steering wheel and the system will, will automatically uh, park the vehicle itself with the support of electric power steering the assistant will perform all the steering moments and guides the vehicle even in the tightest spaces so the driver uh, but uh, as i said earlier since this is also not a like, kind of full automation of course as a driver it is still our responsibility that we need to watch what is happening and if anything goes wrong immediately we need to take a control so it's a disclaimer here in addition what as i said earlier the way the car went inside a parking it remembers that way it will just reverse its own operation the same way it will come out thereby you don't need to struggle again for taking the car out if it is in a uh, very uh, crunch zone so the car itself will know how it parked last time it will just understand or it will just recalculate itself to come out and from that position you can take a leap so this is how the parking system works i'll take a slight pass here for uh, any questions on adas topics which we have discussed until now if it's clear and at least anyone please say it's okay so that it's clear sir thank you thank you vivek okay so uh, i'll proceed with my next system um, cruise control system uh, one of the very uh, relaxing feature which is available in today's car May, almost most of the cars is having this cruise control feature will, which will be appreciated by drivers especially who are uh, driving for a long continuously on a highway pressing the brake the accelerator clutch uh, will be a tedious job when we are driving for a long time this feature will help us uh, will help us to uh, accelerate by itself and brake by itself whenever there is going to be uh, an obstacle or something like that thereby our duty is to just control the steer our portion of work has been taken by the car itself to assist us okay so it's a intelligent form of cruise control now cruise control is nothing but uh, acceleration will be done by the car adaptive cruise control is nothing but 
uh, the cruise control will be done by the car which will be adapted to the environment i will explain you what an adaptive cruise control is it's kind of an intelligent form of a cruise control that will slow down and speeds up automatically to keep uh, to keep pace with the car in front of you few years back we will be just having the cruise control system the system doesn't know whether there is an obstacle in front if you if you did not notice the system will go on bang but with the help of adaptive cruise control system the system will identify with the help of sensors whether there is going to be an obstacle in front or it or an obstacle has suddenly approached our uh, path whatever it is system uh, say for example we are cruising at a speed of 80 kmph the system will try to reduce the speed from maybe from 80 to 40 or 40 to 20 whether the uh, uh, the ultimate aim is that the obstacle which is in our front should be at a safe distance if the safe distance is not met the system will apply an emergency braking in order to avoid an accident so this is how the overall explanation of cruise control adaptive cruise control system where it will equip a multi purpose camera in order to scan the field and also front radar in order to exactly estimate the distance between our uh, uh, car and the uh, ongoing car so how it works a radar which is uh, you should radar is normally the core of the adaptive cruise control system which is installed in the front portion of the car as long as the road ahead is very clear that means there is no cars in front it maintains the set speed by the driver we can set whatever speed like 80 100 whatever it is if the system spots a slower vehicle within its detection range it gently reduces the speed by releasing the accelerator or actively engaging the brake so normally uh, at first it will not reduce the uh, reduce the uh, sorry it will not apply the brake it will reduce the speed first even after reducing the speed uh, if uh, we are in a non safe zone it will automatically apply the brakes if the vehicle ahead speeds up or changes the lanes the acc system automatically accelerates to the driver's desired speed so this is a reverse like when once the traffic is cleared it will automatically uh, go back to its set speed so it is like a, it's a comfort and convenience systems brake intervention and vehicle acceleration take place only within the defined limits and uh, even with the acc switched on again it's a disclaimer that uh, since it is not a fully autonomous system it's a driver's responsibility to monitor uh, monitor the speed and distance in the front suppose if anything goes wrong of course it will not 99.99% but still there is a 0.001% chance the system will fail so it is always advisable uh, to have a control or just keep watch on what is happening in the adas systems what are some of the benefits in this type of system comfortable and relaxed driving as i said you can take your hands off this uh, sorry you can take your legs off the accelerator and brake you can just monitor only the steering it will support the drivers in maintaining a safe distance which will avoid accidents one thing which will be improved is fuel efficient because having the brake and accelerator uh, uh, vice versa continuously might uh, reduce our fuel efficiency so once we are uh, uh, cruising in a desired speed our uh, fuel efficiency will increase it will also avoid uh, the risk of the rear end collisions of the other vehicle the driver is better able to concentrate on just current traffic situations rather than uh, focusing on um, the acceleration and all uh, there is a study which showed that the fuel consumption you it can decrease up to 10% if we properly use the system and uh, it also uh, avoids uh, rear end collisions and eases the driving task yes so moving to the next system uh it's also it is also coming under radar which is called as fcw fcw is nothing but a forward collision warning as the word warning suggests it is just a warning to the driver and it's the responsibility of the driver to take an action wherever it is necessary what the forward coll- forward collision warning system will do is it will just monitor it's, it's like a portion of the one which we saw earlier in our cruise control it will just monitor the vehicle which is in front even though the cruise control is not equipped you assume you are driving in a city traffics or whatever it is in a normal situation it will just monitor the vehicle with the help of sensors uh sensors like the same ultrasonic or radar to detect the slow moving vehicles when the distance is, is very short and uh, there is a possibility of a crash it immediately alerts the driver so this technology will provide with an audible alert as well and a visual display so that the driver is notified promptly so fcw system will help the frontal crashes into the rear of a slower moving and stopped vehicles so again as i said earlier so it will give you a warning so that you can take your informed decision whether to brake or reduce the speed or whatever it is so uh, this uh, uh, you can ask like why when we have an advanced system why do we need to have a system like this but the answer is this is a low cost solution uh, going to such type of a fully automated systems will increase our cost of the car ultimately and uh, at least to uh, provide a certain level of warning uh, with a low cost solution 
this is one of the nice to have feature. Coming to the next uh, topic in the ADAS, it's a, it's a rear cross traffic alert. Uh, this uh, scenarios we would have experienced in malls when we are taking a reverse. Uh, such kind of parallel parkings are normally available in malls and some uh, theaters and all. So when when we uh, take uh, when we are reversing, and if uh, because our reversing view will be only limited to this area, this will be the detection area. But you cannot detect any cars coming from this angle, which is at a high speed, or this angle, which is at a uh, th uh, this way, which is normally uh, in a high speed, because this is a straight road. Drivers used to travel very fast here. So this kind of system will alert us if there is a vehicle which is approaching in the out of zone area. The working principle is same. Uh, uses the radar or ultrasonic sensors, of course, mounted in a different angle in order to detect an extended range of uh, rear cross traffic. Uh, it will be located in the sides of your vehicle in the rear bumper and it will look like buttons, a, 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 like how a shirt button will look. It will be looked in the same way. Uh, so when a rear traffic, a rear cross traffic alert system will use the same sensors, like the blind spot monitoring, as I said earlier, it's the similar uh, type of sensors which we use. These sensors monitor both sides of your vehicle in the detection areas. And when an approach is detection system, how we saw in FCW, portation warning, it will just do a warning so that you can take an informed decision whether to proceed with uh, proceed with reversing or you can just stop there. Uh, it's basically uh, our decision. So with this, our ADAS features are coming to an end. Next, I'm going to move to an interesting topic, TPMS, but I would like to have a quick break um, for any questions until now. All okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we will proceed. TPMS tire pressure monitoring. I would like to have a question. I would like to ask a question here. What are the disadvantages of driving a vehicle with an underinflated tire? What are the disadvantages or what are the issues which we will face when we are driving our car or motorbike also? That means a built set pressure. We want there are steering control. Multiple disadvantage yes one good thing we don't have a proper steering control Either way, there are multiple disadvantages and no no low mileage no mileage exactly yes fuel efficiency will come down next please So uh, the major disadvantages of having a, a underinflated tire, or driving with an underinflated tire, is that first thing, your life of a tire will come down. The tire will wear out very soon. Uh, not, uh, if uh, say, for example, if it's coming for fifteen thousand kilometers, and if you run continuously uh, with the underinflated tire, it will just wear out at seven thousand or eight thousand. Disadvantages. Second, fuel efficiency. Driving a car with an underinflated tire will reduce your fuel efficiency. Third thing is your braking will be abnormal. You're, you you can't have a proper braking when you have an underinflated tire. So these are some of the major disadvantages, and these disadvantages are viewed as a safety aspect in terms of um, in terms of automobile thing. This is a severe safety. So it is mandatory for us to. Uh, uh, to show you or to uh, warn you that the tire pressure is going low and it is uh, it, it should be attended immediately by just the refilling. So tire pressure monitoring system is an electronic system in our vehicle that monitors our tire air pressure and alerts when it falls dangerously. The purpose is, the, is to warn you that at least one or more tires are significantly underinflated and uh, you are you are in an unsafe driving condition. The TPMS, the low tire pressure indicator, is normally a regulated symbol by this. Whenever this symbol you see anywhere, you can just understand that the tire pressure 
is low. That resembles like a horseshoe with an exclamation point. This is just a symbol. There are two types of a TPMS system. One is an indirect TPMS, another is a direct TPMS. Indirect TPMS, uh, in the beginning of the slides, we saw one system called as vehicle dynamic control or stability control. The system which will help us to avoid a slippage or, run, uh, or driving in a slippery surface. That system has a speed sensor. So as I said, the systems will be having a speed sensor secured in all the four wheels. When there is an underinflated tire in your car, the comparative speed will be low. So sorry, the speed will be high. The speed of rotation of that particular wheel will be high when compared to a normally inflated tire. The system will understand this concept. It will differentiate within itself that there is something wrong happening in the uh, air pressure of the wheel. And it will just give us a warning that any one of the tires, it, it cannot point out exactly which tire is underinflated, but still it will uh, let you know that some tire out of one out of four is underinflated. This system will also help us say, for example, if any tire has gone puncture and if you are replaced with a spare wheel, that situation also, it will give you a warning. Basic that uh, that calls for you to immediately address the one which has got punctured and replace it with the actual tire. You, you, you cannot use a spare tire for longer time. So you can ask, what, what is what are the advantages of uh, this type of system? Because it does not give us a direct pressure value because there are no sensors which will calculate what pressure in terms of PSI or kilogram, some kilogram per meters per whatever. So that unit is not directly available. It will just give you a warning. It, the system doesn't know whether uh, which which wheel has which wheel has uh, uh, which tire has a low pressure. It neither gives you uh, the exact pressure value, but still it is a good to have system. Uh, at least it will give you a warning that some wheel has a low pressure, and you can still uh, refill. Uh, sorry, you can still uh, fill it up with air as early as possible. So. This system is relatively inexpensive when compared to the direct TPMS, which I will explain very shortly. It requires a less programming and very less maintenance, less overall installation um, and maintenance when it's compared to the direct TPMS counterpart. What are some of the disadvantages? Maybe inaccurate. As I said, it, it is not an accurate system and uh, not very reliable system, of course. And you need to reset every time after you are inflating a tire. So uh, as I said, this is just a warning which doesn't calculate the exact pressure, which means you need to inform the system through somehow there will be buttons available in order to reset. So once you fill the car, once you fill the uh, tire, uh, in order to make this warning disappear, which I showed here, this will be still lit. What you need to do, you just need to do a reset in the system so that it will disappear. And uh, every time you change a tire, you need to reset a system. So these are some of the disadvantages, but still it is nice to have feature. All these disadvantages will be overcome by the direct TPMS system. Direct TPMS, the word itself says that it has a direct sensors, which are pressure sensors basically, which is mounted on uh, or the four wheels of the car. And these sensors will give the data to an electronic control unit wirelessly. Wirelessly, it will transmit the data and each sensor has a unique number. You, with this unique serial number, the system will identify which wheel or which tire has uh, is underinflated and that information will be given to the driver information or instrument uh, cluster. Thereby, you can see the exact value of the pressure which is available in the particular wheel. It will also warn you which tire has exactly worn out or even if it's a puncture, this will give you a warning. As I said, this is a very advantageous system. It will give you actual pressure readings and 99.99% uh, .99 accuracy can be met because of the accuracy in uh, sensor uh, technologies. So simple resynchronization after the tire rotation or replacement and uh, the batteries inside the sensor normally will last for a decade so that you don't need to worry of replacing the batteries every time. Maybe uh, this uh, in some case, sometimes even in the spare tire also will come with this sensor so that you don't need to replace the sensor at that time. But some disadvantages is that this system is expensive as we have a wireless system. Of course, the cost will go up. So uh, the synchronization, as I said, we, whenever we are doing a tire replacement, we need to resynchronize this. Uh, of course, this will be done by the dealers where you uh, request to change, uh, change the tire. And uh, you cannot service a battery. If a battery is worn out, the entire sensor must be replaced. And uh, a proper installation service and maintenance has to be done just like uh, our other systems. And uh, whenever uh, we are mounting or demounting, 
the resensors can damage but these are some of the disadvantages but when you see the advantages of this system especially when it is contributing to your fuel economy and uh, increased safety of course it's always preferable to have a direct tpms system coming to the next uh, portion of uh, our comfort and convenience the first system will be the climate control system so uh, it's very mandatory in a country uh, which is more humid or even you can consider india as an example so without a climate control system it's possibly uh, it's it's all, it's next to impossible to drive a car for uh, long distance continuously so this automatic climate control system is most advanced of all the air conditioning systems which is available in car what it does it effectively controls the cabin temperature and humidity levels in the climate control you can set the temperature of our choice basically However, the system controls it regardless of the outside air temperature. It, it, it just measures the outside air temperature, but it will always work towards your set temperature. Some people may need uh, around 25, 26 as their comfort zone. Some people have 20, 21. Whatever you set, the system will work accordingly. Some advanced systems will offer dual zone climate. Maybe as a driver, you will be, ha you'll be having your own set temperature. For passenger, if they are comfortable with different set temperature, the system will automatically adjust itself so that it will provide air comfort for both, even for all the passengers in the car. That's how it works. Uh, basically, you'll be having a temperature sensor, an air quality sensor, and a humidity sensor. Temperature sensor to identify uh, the outside air temperature, air quality to measure the internal uh, quality of air, the PM 2.5 values, and the humidity sensor to uh, find the level of humidity uh, which is inside the car. So uh, the automatic climate control system will have an electronic regulators, of course, in order to adjust the air temperature, the air flow rate, and the air distribution. Some in sometimes during the rainy season and all, you would have experienced uh, our car will uh, fog itself internally. This uh, system will help us by defogging, by opening the defogger nozzles whenever there is a uh, need for a defog. So even in budget cars today, we are uh, offered with this particular feature uh, so that passenger or uh, the users of the vehicle can travel comfortably. What are some of the features which are offered is dual zone climate control. As I said earlier, we can have a separate climate control for a driver and for a passenger. In some advanced vehicles like Mercedes and all, we'll be having four zone, which means a driver, a co-passenger, and the passengers who are in the rear seat. There are some innovative events uh, like in, if you take Mahindra, Marazu and all, some other OEMs is offering side winds rather than having the straight winds. They are also offering side winds. And if you take a Renault Triber, there will be winds in the pillars. That will offer even additional uh, comfort for the passengers who want uh, some, uh, who want to, who wants very chill atmosphere in the car. This can also be extended to cool your glow boxes where you can keep the juices or any stuff which, which you uh, would like to be uh, cool always. So these are some of the uh, features which are offered by the passenger uh, comfort climate control system. Moving to very uh, interesting and uh, very important, of course, especially for the long uh, driver, uh, drivers who travel for uh, continuously for long distance, the drowsiness detection system. Fatigue and micro sleep at the wheel are often cause of serious accidents. Many of us would have felt even for a long trip in a car in a very comfort zone in a very quiet zone it's it's a normal tendency for a human being to sleep but a person at a wheel uh, does this it can result us in a fatal accident so this drowsiness detection system through several kinds of algorithm will detect that the driver is drowsy and his driving is not in an appropriate behavior which is intended to be and it will give us a warning to take a break that is the basic working of this driver uh, drowsiness detection system. So what it does? It is, ba it is based on an algorithm which begins to record the driver steering behavior. Normally, a person who is dozed off will tend to oversteer or it, he will do a sudden steering or he will apply a sudden braking or for a longer amount of time, he will never touch this, he will never steer at all. So these are some of the signs which is monitored by this artificial intelligence system. It then recognizes the changes over the course of long trips, how long you are driving, how continuously you are driving, all these data, all these data, the length of the trip, the use of turn signals, the time of the day, everything it calculates and it will determine whether the driver is fatigued or not. If that level, which is going to exceed a certain value, an icon such as this, like a take a break or a coffee symbol with something, it will just pop up with a mild warning sound 
so that the user can really see to this he can acknowledge he can park a car take a rest and then he can continue his drive so even there are some of the uh, most advanced machine learning systems today uh, the work is still in progress it's just equipped in very high end vehicles it will it will monitor your head behavior as you can see in this image if you turn your head this way that way or something like that it will monitor that thereby rather than calculating all these the length of the trip the use of steering and all it will directly find whether you are sleepy or not even it will monitor whether you are your eyes are opened or closed with this ai system the uh, the system will identify whether you are drowsy or not and then it will give you a warning so that you can have a break is it and before moving to the next system we have just a couple of systems left i would take a short break here for your questions all okay yes, hello clear sir okay thank you very much i'll move to the next system this is again a passenger comfort system of ventilated seats um this ventilated seats is one of the innovative idea especially for very hot countries like india dubai and all the ventilate uh, we would have experienced this we would have uh, in all places we cannot get a closed park normally we used to park our cars in a hot sun after so after a hour or two our cabin temperature will shoot up to a exceeding or a alarming level and once you go sit in your car you cannot sit literally you need to switch on the ac wait for some time outside the car and then only you can even touch the seat or steering wheel this kind of discomfort uh, is a lot of annoying especially when we are in an emergency we need to go quickly and this is kind of annoying and continuous use of air conditioners will of course increase our uh, energy utilization and the solution is the air conditioned seats this is kind of energy efficient system and it will eliminate the seat burn sensation whenever sitting on a super heated or sun warmed upholstery upholstery is nothing but the leather which is perforated over there and the sweat stains so coming to the system it's it's basically the ventilated seat uh, the fabric of the car seat is a porous mesh so that the air can flow through it there will be multiple fans which will be installed inside to produce an air circulation basically it's an exhaust system the system which just want to let the heat out of the seat so the this fans will blow out the air in through the diffusion layer and uh, and it spreads the cooling into the seat so that your seat is cooled ordinarily we eject heat through the pores in the form of water vapor which carries the heat invisibly into the hair this is even applicable for human beings so like uh, our heat will dissipate through the pores in our skin in the same way in some cases we can also use air conditioning here so air conditioned seats uh, will use a refrigerated air rather than blowing in a normal air it will the already we have an air conditioning system in the car a portion of it will be uh, given into the seats in order to quickly cool out and and make our heat uh, sorry make our seat uh, lightly heated or uh, even in a chilled uh, way so that you can sit comfortably when you enter a car and uh, to the surprise this system will work very fast within a seconds it just two or three seconds your seat will come to the normal temperature uh, this feature is currently offered by kia seltos and kia sonet in some of the high end models which uh, if you have an opportunity you can go check uh, in the dealers uh, this is a very good feature coming to the next uh, system rain sensing wipers uh, one of the very intuitive uh, technology which senses uh whether the our uh, the french uh, the front windshield is completely accumulated with the rain drops and it will automatically switch on the wipers uh, it's just a kind of uh, automation system where uh, rather than manually adjusting the speed of the wiper each and every time it, the system itself will adjust itself accordingly uh based on the amount of accumulation of the rain drops here so uh it will come into automatically it's basically a sensor based system and uh, one initially very uh, few luxury cars had this feature but due to the popularity uh, however it is uh, the it is gaining uh, traction nowadays and most of the cars are offering this system today so how it works basically again it's an electronic module which is fitted in the near the wind uh, wind screen which acts as a brain for the system it has a light emitting diode which preferably will be an infrared leds when the glass is clear the light which is sent out from the diode will be totally reflected back without any deviation 
but when there are water droplets which are available in the gas the infrared light beam passes through that instead of reflecting so the amount of light which is coming back to the sensor will be very low with this particular uh, evolution uh, sorry with this particular uh, sensing the voltage level will differ for example when the when the reflected light is more it generates more voltage and vice versa so the engineers program the electronic module in such a way that the wiper will be activated when the generated voltage is less when it reflects a very small light the speed and time of activation of wipers will also depend on the degree of the wetness of the windscreen so with the level of reflection as i said earlier the voltage will differ when the voltage differs normally we can adjust the speed of the wiper so that the accumulations can be eliminated some advanced systems are also capable of measuring the moisture level on the windscreen and thereby that way also you can control the speed of the wiper and switching on and off the wiper so this is how the rain sensing wiper works coming to the final portion of our uh, lecture series today so we are going to see one of the most nice to have feature which is a heads up display heads up display is nothing but an augmented reality feature which is available in the car which will present a data in a transparent display like this so uh, there will be uh, the you can you, you, it will appear as if this particular information either the speed or the direction which you need to travel if you put on the navigation or some of the safety signs or some of the safety warnings will be projected here you can ask me a question you have uh, already an instrument cluster like this in a car why do we need this okay now i will give you a scenario assume you are traveling at a speed of 120 kmph in a highway and you are notified by some kind of warning what you need to do you need to turn your head for a second just for one second you need to turn your head down or uh, towards your uh, uh, left or right somewhere wherever the information is coming you just need to turn your head for a second traveling at a speed of 120 kmph if you do this you will lose around 33 meters of the road which will be fatal in if if something happens in between suppose even for a second if you look and if something comes in between you will miss as i said it's 30 plus meters which is quite a considerable distance so this type of displays when it is a cube you you no need to turn your head in order to see the valuable information the information will be just right in front of your eyesight and you can you can uh, you can also adjust the level of brightness the color of the information with which it is displayed everything is basically adjustable so this is the core importance of this heads up display initially it was used in the military aviation back in 1950s where it will display the altitude speed and even the target systems in front of a cockpit so this allowed the pilots to receive the information up at the eye level by looking forward with their heads up heads up position instead of having to look away from another piece if you see flight there will be a lots and lots of equipments and all the equipments cannot be viewed by the pilot at the same time so all the critical information will be brought right into his front of his eyes so that he can concentrate only on the traversing so there are two types in this uh, heads up display basically one is the windshield heads up display and the second thing is the combiner heads up display so windshield heads up display will have uh, Uh, the information projected right in the front of your windshield uh, so that it will literally appear as if the information is available on the road you can just imagine this like uh, whenever you are standing in front of a mirror to whenever we are viewing your face the distance between the real you and the mirror will be equal to the distance between the mirror and the opposite of you so the distance which how much distance we get away from the mirror that far you can also see the reflected image in the mirror it's the same principle here B by adjusting some of the parameters which i will show in the next slide you can just be, you can just uh, move this distance and uh, to your comfortable position the second type is the combiner heads up display where there will be a glass like apparatus of course this is not a permanent whenever you don't want it this glass will automatically go down and this combiner heads up display is available in kia seltos uh in some of the top end models so when at a press of a button this glass will pop up and uh, you can also control what information you need here what information you don't need you can control the color you can control the positions etc so this is basically the work where you will be having a light source here this light source will be reflected to a fold mirror fold mirror and to a rot uh, rotatable mirror here basically this will be adjusting the height as i said earlier this is adjustable this will be adjusting this image will fall here actually the image will fall here but 
when we are viewing from the seat of the driver, it will appear as if it is available here. So good uh, uh, kind of physics is applied here so that you can have a virtual image, thereby some necessary information like speed and the direction which we need to travel can be available here. So this is it for the heads up display. Uh, with this, the technologies which I would I wanted to share it with you comes to an end. But I would also like to give you a gist on the level of automation uh, before I end up my session because um, the main reason I added this slide is that when I when I had a similar presentation last year, uh, I, I I literally faced difficulties in explaining which car has this feature. Now, if I see almost the all almost eight, 70 to eighty percent of the features which I explain is available in the all the cars in Indian market, as I said, in in Kia, Toyotas, even uh, even in even in uh, a lower end of Maruti cars, in my company's cars, everywhere, every uh, every cars are gaining traction towards safety, and we are equipped with almost uh, all the features which I explained. So. With this, maybe down the lane in five uh, years or uh, even lesser than that, we we will also see uh, automation in cars. The car, if we can also see like cars will drive itself very soon in future. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on the levels of uh, driving automation. Of course, this itself will take maybe one or two sessions to explain it fully, but I will not go very deep into this session, but I will give you a slight heads up. The level zero, which is available in today is no automation. Basically, the driver is responsible to take the entire control of the car. And coming to level one automation, level one automation is driver assistance, where the vehicle features a single automated system, maybe a cruise control, which I explained earlier, just a cruise control. You can just take your legs off the accelerator pedal for some distance. That is the level one driver assistance. Level two, this uh, 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 level two driver assistance is basically a partial automation where you can take your hands off the steering wheel for some time, not always, for some time, you can take your hands off the steering wheel, but you need to still monitor the task at any time and take control. This is uh, this one I explained in the adaptive cruise control feature. You would have recently viewed the videos, anybody, if you are interested, go check the video of Mahindra XUV 700. Mahindra XUV 700, which is recently launched by Mahindra, is having this feature of adaptive cruise control and it's kind of a level two automation where uh, when, uh, whenever the vehicle in front of you is slowing down or stopping, our vehicle will automatically stop. Okay, it's kind of a partial automation. Moving to the level three, it's a condition automation. The environmental detection capabilities are available. The vehicle will detect the one which is in the front. Vehicle can perform driving tasks it also controls the steering, but still here also the human override is required. Coming to level four is a high automation where the vehicle will perform all the duty, even steering, even you can put the navigation, just sit back and relax, but it will not do in all areas. In the urban traffic areas, this will not happen. Only in the geo-fenced areas, few areas, the uh, OEM, the provider, which uh, maybe you can consider Tesla, Tesla is in this level today. Uh, they are offering uh, level uh, four automation in some places and some models of Tesla cars. Moving to five is the full automation of cars where you can just sit back, relax. You can see the symbol here, the driver is reading a book. You don't need to do anything. The car itself will completely take care of everything, which is still under beta testing by several OEMs, including Tesla. Um, very soon, we'll be having this in countries like US and UK. And slowly in India, we are moving from step level one to two. Level two is provided by even in MG uh, hectares and asters, which was released recently. We, we can see level two automation. We are slowly moving towards and very soon we will reach the step five. So I finally uh, conclude my session and I uh, stop here for any questions and answers and feedbacks about my presentation. Thank you very much. Participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, raise it in chat box.